Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ross, and I'm super nervous and even a little bit uncomfortable at this moment. And I actually just realized, like, just how this red carpet is supposed to keep me in one place. Society has been doing that for a big part of my life. So, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to step out of it, if that's okay with you. Now, I'm sure all of you here today have felt uncomfortable or nervous before, whether it was at work dealing with a difficult colleague or a client, at a family gathering with all your crazy aunts and uncles asking you in front of everyone, when are you going to get married? Or the dreadful moment of standing on a stage in front of a bunch of strangers and doing a talk that might leave you vulnerable to rejection and even hate. For me, and many others like me, this has been our life. Most of my life has been spent on a stage, and boy, did I give the performance of a lifetime. Always worried, always scared. I have lived a life in waiting, waiting for either acceptance or rejection. Growing up gay should be just that, growing up. But sadly, it's not. The truth is, growing up gay comes with an insurmountable amount of doubt, a paralyzing weight of questions that move at a thousand miles an hour in the small space in your head, causing a storm of confusion. These questions pierce, prick, and scrape. They hurt and bruise, and the destruction they leave behind is permanent. That's how you grow up gay, and in some cases, grow old. You see, these damaging questions that the LGBTQ plus community wrestle with are answered primarily by the movies we watch, the books we read, the music we listen to, our teachers at school, our leaders in parliament, and if you grew up in a religious environment like I did, by your parents and your church. The problem is that these same movies, books, music, and institutions answered the rest of society's questions too. A heterosexual society, of course. And therefore, places like schools, churches, and governments feel validated in their opinions towards the gay community. I grew up watching movies about the euro saving the damsel in distress. I listened to songs of how men and women proclaim their undying love to one another. I read books of love triangles and affairs between men and women, but nowhere did I see me. And if I didn't see me, how could what I was going through be normal? How was I supposed to learn to love and accept myself? How do I validate someone like myself's existence in a society that's not like me at all? Validate. What does it even mean to validate? According to the Cambridge Dictionary, to validate means to make something officially approved or accepted, especially after examining it, or to prove that something is correct. We validate things like household appliances, cars, degrees, just to name a few. So why then do we use these same principles of validation on people? Which standards do we use to measure people with in order to declare them being acceptable, approved, or correct? We, as a society, unconsciously changed the definition of validate to make someone, rather than something, acceptable, approved, or correct. Now, if we lived in a homogenous society where we all looked the same, dressed the same, and had the same thoughts, we would have had a certain level of standards we could have used to measure each other with, and in that way, we would have been able to validate each other's existence as part of our community. But we're not a homogenous society. In fact, we claim to celebrate and encourage individuality. 
which means we shouldn't have standards that validate someone's existence, as this stands in direct contrast with what we believe to be individualism. This false sense of validation we created amplifies the vulnerability experienced by each member within the LGBTQ community. You see, when we validate something we de and determine whether it's up to standard, we either approve this item or disapprove this item. And it's not any different when it comes to people. When a certain group of people don't fit the mold, a mold that was carefully curated by Western society, that bases its norms and values on a Christian ideology, and that only ever favored a selected few, we then label these people as different. The problem with that is that we live in a diverse world, overflowing with a variety of different races, cultures, religions, values, norms. Yet, we label people as different based on one culture's religious beliefs. Now I know some of you might think, but what about these other cultures and religions that condemn homosexuality? If I claim that society bases its norms and values on a Christian ideology, how do I then explain these other religions that condemn the same groups of people based on their religion's own set of customs and beliefs? The answer is easy. Colonialism. A 2018 article posted in The Economist explains how homosexuality became a crime in the Middle East. Now, before colonialism, in the 13th and 14th centuries, two poets called Rumi and Hafiz lived in what we know today as Iran. Some of their poems centered around writing about males in affectionate and even passionate terms. Their reflections weren't seen as new or unfamiliar at the time. And this outspokenness to homosexual love used to be extended throughout the Middle East. However, in 1885, the British government imposed laws in the Middle East that would punish all homosexual behavior in an attempt to control and undermine Islam's permissive civilization. Even though these countries had their own beliefs, they were still, wait, they are still negatively impacted by a civilization that forced their own agenda upon people that they needed to control. According to the International LGBTI Association, same-sex sexual relations are still illegal in more than half the countries which once fell under British rule. This legislation was inherited by Western civilization and left in place following independence. These inhumane laws are a direct result of what we call labeling people. We use these laws to validate someone and then deem them as unacceptable or incorrect. And with that, an entire community is left vulnerable to forms of abuse that are so grotesque and dehumanizing, stripping these people from their most basic human rights. Ask Ali Reza Monfared from Iran, who tried to flee his country for difficulties he faced for being gay, and then being murdered, murdered by his own family. What is this fear people harbor inside themselves? Why are people so scared of something or someone that is different from them? Michael Lewis, a professor in psychology, argues that the reactions of the people around us might influence our responses to threatening situations. He goes on by saying, and I quote, that we learn to become fearful through experience with a fear event, or by learning from those people around us, like our parents, our siblings, or our colleagues. Fear has a certain contagious feature to it. 
And the fear in others can elicit fear in ourselves. And this is called observational learning, which is described in an article by Anne Trafton from MIT using the following example. Imagine witnessing someone getting chased by a dog in your neighborhood. Now, you would learn to keep a safe distance from that dog without having to go through the experience yourself. Observational learning in itself isn't a bad thing, but the implications it has on the LGBTQ plus community comes with a consequence. All of my observations regarding homosexuality since I was a little boy, up until now, have been negative. And this created a fear within me. And what makes this fear dangerous is that it's irrational and a response to something that is not a threat at all. And this is called a phobia. Homophobia has left members in this community in a state of vulnerability that few others will ever experience. People fear and have discomfort with people who identify as gay or transgender just because these people don't live a lifestyle that, according to them, is the norm. What's even more sad about this is the fact that these people were taught to fear and hate by the very institutions who are apparently fighting for and protecting our human rights. Supposedly, keeping us safe from harm, and evidently educating us into becoming more well-rounded individuals. If these institutions then claim to fight for and protect our human rights, they should start by re-evaluating their definition of the word human and start to include everyone. In order to do this, they would have to start from the very beginning Education, which brings me to the Don't Say Gay Bill, which was recently imposed in schools across Florida in the United States. This bill limits classroom instruction on gender identity and sexual orientation. There exists this dirty sexual connotation to the LGBTQ plus community, and people link this connotation to classroom instruction because for them, being gay means being promiscuous. According to the article, Fear of the Queer Child by Clifford Roski, parents are afraid that their children might develop homosexual desires or deviate from traditional gender norms if they are exposed to homosexuality. I've known I was gay since the age of four. I grew up learning about traditional gender norms, and yet I didn't turn straight. My sexual orientation didn't change, even though I wanted it to change. I cried and I prayed to God to take these feelings away. All I wanted was to be like the rest of the boys. But here I am today, 32 years later, and nothing has changed. Research by the Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital state that by the ages of two and three, children already start to understand the differences between boys and girls and can therefore identify as either one or the other. So teaching kids in school about homosexuality will not cause them to deviate from traditional gender norms, nor will it change their gender identity, since this has already been established at an earlier age. What it would do, however, is create a society that understands and accepts, and one that is done with fear and hate. All we ask is for a safe space for children to learn about different people, so that we can reach a point in life where we are seen as normal people. What's really frightening about this bill is that it elicits fear amongst a young group of people who might identify as gay or transgender and then further alienates them from the rest of society. The bill forbids school counselors and teachers from keeping personal information regarding a student's sexuality confidential. They claim that 
being gay damages your mental, emotional, and physical well-being. And therefore, parents should be informed in order to protect their children. Being gay does not damage your mental, emotional, or physical well-being. It's a society that forces one way of living down everyone's throats that damages your well-being. So, how does this bill make things better by forcing teachers and counselors to out students who came to them in confidentiality? What if these students come from homophobic or transphobic families that would hurt, bully, and even kill them for being gay or transgender? How can anything in this scenario be good for a child's mental, emotional, or physical well-being? If we have safe learning environments for heterosexual children, the same should be done for homosexual and transgendered students who are already suffering the brunt of being treated like second-class citizens. If all these students are seen as human, surely they all deserve the same rights. We have been hating and discriminating against the LGBTQ plus community for years and years now. Now is the time to break these chains of fear that so many people have towards this community. If observational fear is taught, surely it can be unlearned. So, open your hearts and minds and try to understand that there is a vulnerable community out there. People who are tired of living on a stage and who desire more than anything else to be treated equally. When this happens, growing up gay would be just that, growing up. Thank you.